from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Semiconductors are the heart of technology innovation. For decades, technology improvements have marched to the cadence of silicon advancements in performance costs, power, and packaging. In the past 10 years, the dynamics of the semiconductor industry have changed dramatically. Soaring factory costs, device volume explosions, fabulous chip companies, greater programmability, compressed time to tape out, a lot more software content, the looming presence of China, these and other factors have changed the power structure of the semiconductor business. Chips today power every aspect of our lives and have led to a global semiconductor shortage that's been well covered, but we've never seen anything like it before. We believe silicon success in the next 20 years will be determined by volume manufacturing capabilities, design innovation, public policy, geopolitical dynamics, visionary leadership, and innovative business models that can survive the intense competition in one of the most challenging businesses in the world. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, it's our pleasure to welcome Daniel Newman in, one of the leading analysts in the technology business and founder of Futurum Research. Daniel, welcome to the program. Thanks so much. Dave, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Big topic. Yeah, I'll say, I'm really looking forward to this. And, and so here's some of the topics that we want to cover today, if we have time. Changes in the semiconductor industry, I've said they've been dramatic, the shift to no fab companies. We're going to talk about volume manufacturing, those shifts that have occurred largely due to the ARM model. We want to cover Intel and dig into that and what it has to do to, to survive and thrive these changes. And then we want to take a look at how alternative processors are, are impacting the world. People talk about is Moore's law dead? Is it alive and well? Daniel, you have strong perspectives on all of this, including NVIDIA. Love to get your thoughts on, on that. Plus talk about the looming China threat, as I mentioned in, in the intro. But Daniel, before we get into it, do these topics, they sound okay? How do you see the state of the semiconductor industry today? Where have we come from? Where are we? And where are we going at the macro level? And yeah, there are a lot of different narratives that are streaming alongside and they're not running in parallel so much as they're running in, in converging towards one another, but it, it gradually different, uh, you know, degrees. So the last two years has welcomed a semiconductor conversation that we really hadn't had, and that was supply chain driven. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic brought pretty much unprecedented desire, demand, thirst for products that are powered by semiconductors. And it wasn't until we started running out of laptops, of vehicles, of servers, that the whole world kind of put the semiconductor in focus again. Like it was just one of those things, Dave, that we as a society had sort of taken for granted. Like if you need a laptop, you go buy a laptop. If you needed a vehicle, there'd always be one on the lot. Um, but as we've seen kind of this exponentialism that's taken place throughout the pandemic, what we ended up realizing is that semiconductors are eating the world. And in fact, the next industrial, the entire industrial itself, the complex is powered by semiconductor technology. So everything we, we do and we want to do, right? You went from a vehicle that might've had $50 or hundred dollars worth of semiconductors on a few different parts to one that might have 700, 800 different chips in it, thousands of dollars worth of, semi, of semiconductors. So, you know, across the board though, yes, you're dealing with the dynamics of the shortage you're dealing with the dynamics of innovation. Um, you're dealing with Moore's law and sort of coming to the end, which is leading to new process. We're dealing with uh, the foundry versus fab versus um, invention and, and product development uh, situation. So there's so many different concurrent semiconductor narratives that are going on, Dave. And we could talk about any of them and all of them. And I'm sure as we do, we'll overlap all these different themes. You know, maybe you could solve this mystery for me. There's this, there's this chip shortage and you can't, Invent vehicle inventory is so tight, but yet when you listen to uh, the, the ads, the, the, the auto manufacturers are pounding the advertising. Maybe they're afraid of Tesla. They don't want to lose their brand awareness, but anyway. Um, so listen, <laughs> just by the way of background, I want to get a little bit academic here, but, but bear with me. I, I want to introduce, actually reintroduce the concept of Wright's Law to our audience. We, know, we all know about Moore's Law, but the earlier instantiation 
actually comes from Theodore Wright. T.P. Wright, he was this engineer in the airplane industry. And the math is a little bit abstract to apply, but roughly translated, it says, as the cumulative number of units produced doubles, your cost per unit declines by a fixed percentage. Now in airplanes, that was around 15%. In semiconductors, we think that number is more like 20, 25%. And when you add the performance improvements you get from silicon advancements, it translates into something like 33% cost, cost declines when you can double your cumulative volume. So that's very important because it confers strategic advantage to the company with the largest volume. So it's a learning curve dynamic. And let's like Andy Jassy says, Daniel, there's no compression algorithm for experience and, it, and it, it definitely applies here. So if you apply Wright's law to what's happening in the industry today, we think we can get a better understanding of, for instance, why TSMC is dominating and why Intel is struggling. Uh, any, any quick thoughts on that? Well, you have to take every formula like that and any sort of standard um, mathematics and kind of throw it out the window when you're dealing with the economic situation we are right now. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not actually throwing it out the window, but what I'm saying is that when supply and demand get out of whack, some of those laws become a little bit um, more difficult to sustain uh, over the long term. What, what I will say about that is we have certainly seen this, found, um, this fabulous model explode over the last few years. You're seeing companies that can focus on software, frameworks, uh, an innovation that aren't necessarily getting caught up in dealing with the large capital expenditures and overhead, the uh, ability to, as you suggested in the topics here, partner with a company like Arm that's developing innovation and then, and then, and then uh, you know, offering it uh, to everybody, right? At, at, for a licensee, and then they can quickly build. We're seeing what that's doing with companies like AWS that are saying, we're going to just build it. Alibaba, we're just going to build it. These aren't chip makers. These aren't companies that were even considered chip makers. They are now today competing as chip makers. So there's a lot of different dynamics. Um, going back to your comment about rights law, like I said, as we normalize and we figure out this situation on a global scale, um, I do believe that the who can manufacture the most will certainly continue to have significant competitive advantages. Yeah, no, so that's a really interesting point that you're bringing up because one of the things that it leads me to think is that the chip shortage could actually benefit Intel, I think will benefit Intel. So I want to introduce this, some other data and then get your thoughts on this. Very simply, the chart on the left shows PC shipments, which peaked in, in 2011 and then began its steady decline until COVID. And they've, the PCs, as, as we know, have popped up in terms of volume in the past year and looks like they'll be up again this year. The chart on the right is cumulative ARM shipments. And so as we've reported, we think ARM wafer volumes are 10X those of x86 volumes. And, and as such, the ARM ecosystem has far better cost structure than Intel. And that's why Pat Gelsinger was called in to sort of save the day. So, so Daniel, I just kind of, again, opened up this, this can of worms, but I, I think you're saying long-term volume is going to be critical. That's going to confer low cost advantages. But in the, in, in the near to midterm, Intel could actually benefit from, uh, from this chip shortage. Well, Intel has the opportunity to position itself as a leader in solving the repatriation crisis. Uh, this will kind of carry over when we talk more about China and Taiwan and that relationship and what's going on there. Uh, we've really identified a massive gap in our uh, in America's supply chain and the global supply chain because we went from, I, I don't have the stat offhand, but I have a rough number, Dave, and we can validate this later, but I think it was in like the 30-ish, high 30-ish percentile uh, of manufacturing of chips were done here in the United States around 1990, and now we're sub 10% as of 2020. So we, we offshored almost all of our production. And so when we hit this crisis and we needed more manufacturing volume, we didn't have it ready. Part of the problem is you get people like Elon Musk that come out and make comments to the media like, oh, it'll be fixed later this year. Well, you can't build a fab in a year. You can't build a fab and start producing volume. And the other problem is not all chips are the same. So not every fab can produce every chip. And when you do have fabs that are capable of pr producing multiple uh, chips, it costs millions of dollars to change the hardware and to actually change the process. So it's not like, oh, we're going to build 28 today because that's what Ford needs to get all those F-150s out of the lot. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to pump out more sevens for you know a, a bunch of HP PCs. It's a major overhaul every time you want to retool. So there's a lot of complexity here, but Intel is the one domestic company, US-based, 
that has basically raised its hand and said, we're going to put major dollars into this. And by the way, Dave, the ARM chart you showed me could have a very big implication as to why Intel wants to do that. Yeah, so right, and that's that's a big part of, of, of Foundry, right, is, is, is get those volumes up. So I, I want to hold that thought because I just want to introduce one more data point because one of the things we often talk about is the way in which alternative processes have exploded onto the scene. And this chart here, uh, if you could bring that up, Patrick, thank you, uh, shows the way in which I think you're pointing out Intel is responding uh, by leveraging alternative fab. But once again, you know, kind of get, getting serious about manufacturing chips. So what the chart shows is the performance curve, it's on a log scale, for, and the blue line is x86, and the orange line is Apple's A series. And we're using that as a proxy for sort of the curve that ARM is on. And it's, and it's performance over time, culminating in the A15, and it measures trillions of operations per second. So if you take the traditional x86 curve of doubling every 18 to 24 months, that comes out roughly to about 40% improvement per year in performance. And that's diminishing, as we all know, to around 30% a year because the you know, Moore's law is waning. The orange line is powered by ARM and it's growing at over 100%, really 110% per year when you do the math. And that's when you combine the CPU, the, the, the neural processing unit, the, 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 the XPU, the DSPs, the accelerators, et cetera. So we're seeing Apple use ARM, AWS to your, to your point is building chips on, on, on Graviton and, 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 and Tesla's using ARM. The list is long and this is one reason why. So Daniel, this curve is, it feels like it's the new performance curve in the industry. Yeah, I, we are certainly in an era where companies are able to take control of the innovation curve using the development, using the open ecosystem of ARM, um, having more direct control and price control. And of course, part of that massive ARM number has to do with you know, mobile devices and IOT and devices that have huge scale. But at the same time, a lot of companies have made the decision either to move some portion of their product development on ARM or to move entirely on ARM. Part of why it was so attractive to NVIDIA, part of the reason that it's under so much scrutiny <laughs> that that deal, um, whether that deal will end up getting completed, Dave. But we are seeing an era where we want, we, I said lust for power. I talked about lust for semiconductors. Our lust for our technology to do more, uh, whether that's software defined vehicles, whether that's the smartphones we keep in our pocket or the uh, desktop computer we use. We want these machines to be as powerful and fast and responsive and scalable as possible. If you can get 100% where you can get 30% improvement with each uh, year and generation, what is the consumer going to want? So I think companies are as normal following the demand of consumers and what's available. And at the same time, there's some economic benefits they're, they're able to realize as well. I, I don't want to, I don't want to go too deep into NVIDIA ARM, but what do you handicap that, the, ch the chances that, that that acquisition actually happens? Oh boy. Um, right now, there's a lot of reasons it should happen, but there are some reasons that it shouldn't. I still kind of consider it a coin toss at this point because Fundamentally speaking, um, you know, it should create more competition, but there are some people out there that believe it could cause less. And so I think this is going to be hung up with regulators a little bit longer than we thought. We've already sort of had some previews into that, Dave, with the extensions and some of the timelines that have already been given. Um, I know that was a safe answer, um, and I, I will take credit for being safe. This one's going to be a hard one to call, but... Uh, it certainly makes NVIDIA an amazing, uh, it gives amazing prospects to NVIDIA if they're able to get this deal done. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's 50-50. Okay, I, I want to pose the question, is Intel too strategic to fail? In March of this year, we published this article where we posed that question. Uh, you and I both know Pat pretty well. We talked about, at the time, the multi-front war Intel is waging. They're in a war with AMD, the ARM ecosystem, TSMC. The, des the design firms, China. And we looked at the company's moves, which seemed to be right from a strategy standpoint, the, looking at the potential impact of the U US government, Intel's partnership with IBM and what that might portend. U US government has a huge incentive to make sure Intel wins with onshore manufacturing 
and that looming threat from China. But Daniel, is Intel too strategic to fail and is Pat Gelsinger making the right moves? Well, first of all, I do believe at this current juncture where the semiconductor and supply chain shortage and crisis uh, still looms, that Intel is too strategic to fail. I also believe that Intel's demise is somewhat overstated. Not to say Intel doesn't have a slate of challenges that it's going to need to address long term, just with the technology adoption curve that you showed being one of them, Dave. But you have to remember the company still has uh, nearly 90% of the server CPU market. It still has a significant market share in uh, client and PC. It is seeing market share erosion, but it's not happened nearly as fast as some people had suggested it would happen. Um, with right now, with the demand in place and as high as it is, Intel is selling chips just about as quickly as it can make them. Um, and so we right now are sort of seeing the TAM as a whole, the demand as a whole continue to expand. And so Intel is fulfilling that need. But where are they really too strategic to fail? I mean, we've seen in certain markets, in certain uh, process in, um, you know, client, for instance, where AMD has gained, of course, that's still x86. We've seen uh, where the M1 was kind of initially thought to be potentially a, a product, product that would take some time. It didn't take nearly as long for them to get that product in good shape. Um, but the foundry and fab side is where I think Intel really has a chance to flourish right now. One, it can play in the ARM space. It can build these facilities to be able to produce and help support the production of volumes of chips using ARM designs. So that actually gives Intel an inroad. Two is it's the company that has made the most outspoken commitment to invest in the manufacturing needs of the United States, both here in the United States and in other um, places across the world where we have friendly ally relationships and need more production capabilities. If not in Intel, it be. And there is no other logical company that's US-based that's gonna meet the regulator and policymakers requirements right now that is also raising their hand and saying, we have the know-how, we've been doing this, we can do more of this. And so I think Pat is leaning into the right area. And I think what will happen is very likely Intel will support manufacturing of chips by companies like Qualcomm, companies like Nvidia. And if they're able to do that, some of the market share losses that, that they're potentially facing with innovation challenges um, and engineering challenges could be offset with growth in their fab and foundry businesses. And I think, I think Pat identified it. I think he's going to market with it and you know, convincing the street. <laughs> that's gonna be a whole nother thing that this is exciting. Um, but I think as the street sees the opportunity here, this is an area that Intel can really lean into. So I think, I think people generally would recognize, at least the folks I talk to, and I'd be interested in your thoughts who really know this business, that Intel you know, had the best manufacturing process in, in the world. Obviously, that's coming to, to question. But, 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 but for instance, people say, well, Intel's 10 nanometer you know, is comparable to TSM seven nanometer. And that's sort of overstated their, their nanometer, you know, loss. But, but so, so they, they were able to point as they were able to sort of hide some of the issues maybe in design with great process. And, and I, I believe that comes down to, to volume. So the question I have then is, and, and I think, so I think Patrick, Pat is doing the right thing because he's going after volume and that's what Foundry brings, but can he get enough volume or does he need, for, inst for instance, I mean, one of the theories I've put out there is that Apple could, could save the day for Intel if the, if the US government gets Apple in a headlock and says, hey, we'll back off on break up big tech, but you got to give Pat some of your foundry volume. That puts him on a steeper learning curve. Do you, do you worry sometimes though, Daniel, that Intel just even with like Qualcomm and Broadcom, who by the way are competitors of theirs and don't necessarily love them, but even, even so, if they could get that, those wins, that they still won't have the volume to compete on a cost basis? Or do you feel like even if they're number, a, a, a number three, even behind Samsung, it's good enough? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't believe a company like Intel goes into a business full steam and, and they're not new to this business, but the obvious volume and expansion that they're looking at with the intention of being number two or three, these great companies and you know, that's, same thing I always say with Google Cloud. Google's not out to be the third cloud. <laughs> They're out to be one. Well, that's Intel will want to, to be stronger. 
if the U.S. government and these investments that it's looking to make in this 50 plus billion dollars it's looking to pour into this particular space, which I don't think is actually enough, but if if the government makes these commitments and Intel being likely one of the recipients of at least some of these dollars to help expedite this process, move forward with building these facilities to ma increase manufacturing, very likely there's going to be some um, precedent of law a policy that is going to be put in place to make sure that a certain amount of the volume is done here stateside with companies. This is a strategic imperative. This is a government strategic imperative. This is a, a putting the country at risk of losing its technology leadership if we cannot manufacture uh, and control this process uh, of innovation. So I think Intel is going to have that as a benefit that the government is going to most likely require some of this manufacturing to take place here. Um, especially if this investment is made, the last thing they're gonna wanna do is build a bunch of foundries and uh, build a bunch of fabs and end up having them not at capacity, especially when the world has seen how much of the manufacturing is now being done in Taiwan. So I think we're concluding, and I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but Intel is too strategic to fail. And, and I, I, I sometimes worry they could go bankrupt you know, trying to compete with the likes of TSMC. And that's why the, the, the public policy and the, and, the, and, and the partnership with the US government and the EU is, I think, so important. Yeah, I don't think bankruptcy is an immediate issue. I think, um, but while I follow your train of thought, Dave, I think what you're really looking at more is, can the company grow and continue to get support? Where I worry about is shareholders getting exhausted with Intel's, the merry-go-round of not growing fast enough, not gaining market share, not being clearly identified as a leader in any particular process or technology, and sort of just playing the role of the incumbent. And they, the company needs to, whether it's in AI, whether it's at the edge, whether it's in the communications and service provider space, Intel is, is doing well. You look at their quarterly numbers, they're making money, but if you had to say, where are they leading right now? What, what, which thing is Intel really winning uh, consistently at? You know, you look at like AI and ML and people will point to NVIDIA. You look at, you know, innovation for um, client, you know, and even AMD has been super disruptive and difficult for Intel. Uh, of course, you, we've already talked about in like mobile, um, how impactful ARM has been, and ARM is also playing a pretty big role in servers. So, like I said, the market share and the technology leadership are a little out of skew right now, and I think that's where Pat's really working hard is identifying the opportunities for, for Intel to play market leader and technology leader again, and for the market to clearly say yes. Um, could Fab and Foundry, you know, could this be an area where Intel becomes the clear leader domestically? And I think that the answer is definitely yes, because none of the big chip makers in the US are, are, <laughs> are doing fabrication. You know, they're, they're all outsourcing it to overseas. So if Intel can really lead that here, grow that large here, then it takes some of the pressure off of the process and the innovation side. And that's not to say that Intel won't have to keep moving there, but it does augment the revenue, creates a new profit center and makes the company even more strategic here domestically. Yeah, and, and Global Foundry tapped out of, of sub 10 nanometer and that's why IBM's suing them. <laughs> like, hey, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> you had a commitment there. The concern I have, and this is where again, your point is I think really important with the chip shortage. You know, to, to go from you know, initial design to tape out, it took Tesla and Apple, you know, I don't know, sub, sub 24 months, you know, probably 18 months. With Intel, we're on a three-year design to tape out cycle, maybe even four years. So they've got to compress that, but that, as you well know, that's a really hard thing to do. But the chip shortage is buying them time. And I think that's a really important point that you brought out early in this segment. So, but the other big question, Daniel, I want to test with you is, well, and you mentioned this about uh, uh, seeing ARM in the enterprise. Not a lot of people talk about that or have visibility on that, but I think you're right on. So will ARM and NVIDIA be able to seriously penetrate the enterprise, the server business in particular, clearly Jensen wants to be there. Now this data from ETR lays out many of the enterprise players and we've superimposed the semiconductor giants in, in, in logos. The data is an XY chart, it shows net score. That's ETR's measure of spending momentum on the vertical axis and market share on the horizontal axis. Market share is not like IDC market share, it's presence in the data set. And as we reported before, AWS, 
is leading the charge in enterprise architecture. As Daniel mentioned, they're, they're designing their own chips. Nitro and Graviton, Microsoft is following suit, as is Google. VMware has Project Monterey. Cisco is on the chart. Dell, HP, IBM with Red Hat are also shown. And we've superimposed Intel, NVIDIA, China, and ARM. And now we can debate the position of the logos, but we know that one, Intel has a dominant position in the data center and it's got to protect that business. It cannot lose ground as it has in PCs because the margin pressure it would face. Two, we know AWS with its Annapurna acquisition is trying to control its own destiny. Three, we know VMware has Project Monterey and is following AWS's lead to support these new workloads beyond x86 general purpose. They got partnerships with Pensando and Arm and others. And four, we know Cisco, they've got chip design chops as does HPE, maybe to a lesser extent. And of course we know IBM has excellent semiconductor design expertise, especially when it comes to things like memory disaggregation. As I said, Jensen's going hard after the data center. You know him well, Daniel. We know China wants to control its own destiny. And then there's ARM, it dominates mobile, as you pointed out, and IOT. Can it make a play for the data center, Daniel? How do you see this picture? And what are your thoughts on the future of enterprise in the context of semiconductor competition? It's going to take some time, I believe, but some of the investments and products that have been brought to market, and, and, and you mentioned that shorter tape out period, that shorter period for innovation, whether it's you know, the Graviton uh, you know, on AWS or the AIML chips that uh, with Tranium and Inferentia, how quickly AWS was able to, you know, develop, build, deploy to market an ARM-based solution that is being well received and becoming an increasing component of the services and and uh, uh, products that are being offered from AWS. At this point, it's still pretty small, and I would I would suggest that Nvidia and ARM, in the spirit of trying to get this deal done, probably don't don't want the enterprise opportunity to be overly inflated as to how quickly the company's going to be able to play in that space, because that would somewhat um, maybe slow or, or bring up some caution flags that it, of the regulators that are, that are monitoring this. At the same time, you could argue that ARM offering additional options in, in competition, much like it's doing in client, will offer new form factors, new designs, um, new uh, you know new SKUs, the OEMs will be able to create more customized uh, hardware offerings that might be able to be unique for certain enterprises, industries, um, can put more focus. You know, we're seeing the disaggregation with DPUs and how that technology using ARM uh, with what AWS is doing with Nitro, uh, but what, what these different companies are doing to, to use, you know, semiconductor technology to split out security, networking and storage. Um, and so you start to see design innovation could become very interesting on the um, foundation of ARM. So in time, I certainly see momentum. Right now, the thing is, is most companies in the enterprise are looking for something that's fairly well-baked off the shelf that can meet their needs, whether it's SAP or whether it's, you know, running different custom applications that the business is built on top of, commerce solutions. And so Intel meets most of those needs. And so ARM has made a lot of sense, for instance, with these cloud scale providers, but not necessarily as much sense for enterprises, especially those that don't want to necessarily look at refactoring all the workloads. But as software becomes simpler, as refactoring becomes easier to do between different, uh, different uh, technologies and processes, uh, you start to say, well, ARM could be compelling. And, you know, because the, the bottom line is we know this from mobile devices is most of us don't care what the processor is, the average person, the average data, you know, the, they look at many of these companies the same. In enterprise, it's always mattered. Um, kind of like in the PC world, it used to really matter. That's where Intel Inside was born. But as we continue to grow up and you see these different processes, these different companies, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, all seen as very worthy companies with very capable technologies in the data center, if they can offer economics, if they can offer performance, if they can offer faster time to value, people will look at them. So I'd say in time, Dave, the answer is ARM will certainly become more and more competitive in the data center like it was able to do at the edge and in mobile. Yeah, one of the things that we've talked about is that you know, the software defined data center is awesome, but it also created a, a, a lot of wasted overhead in terms of offloading, uh, storage and, and networking security. And that, that much of that is being done with general purpose x86 processors, which are 
more expensive than, than for instance, using them. If you look at what, as you mentioned, great summary of what AWS is doing with Graviton and Tranium and other, other tooling, what Ampere is doing um, in, in, in Oracle. And you're seeing both of those companies, for example, particularly AWS, get ISVs to write so they can run general purpose applications on, um, on, on ARM-based processes as well it sets up well for AI inferencing at the edge, which we know ARM's dominating the edge. We see all these new types of workloads coming into the data center. If you look at what companies like Nebulon and Pensando and, and others are doing, uh, you're seeing a lot of their offloads are going to ARM. They're, they're putting ARM in, even though they're still using x86 in a lot of cases, but, but, but they're offloading to ARM. So it seems like they're coming into the back door. I understand your point actually about they don't want to overplay their hand there, especially during these negotiations. But we think that, that long-term, you know, it, it bears watching. But Intel, they have such a strong presence. They got a super strong ecosystem and they really have great relationships with a lot of the the enterprise players, and they have influence over them. So they're going to use that. The, the, the chip shortage benefits them. The, U, the relationship with the US government, Pat is spending a lot of time you know, working that. So it's really going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Daniel, I want to give you the last word, your final kind of thoughts on what we talked about today and where you see this all headed. I think the world benefits as a whole with more competition and more innovation pressure. I like to see more players coming into the fray. I think we've seen Intel react over the last year under Pat Gelsinger's leadership. We've seen the technology innovation, the Angstrom era, the 20A. We're starting to see what that roadmap is going to look like. We've certainly seen how companies like uh, NVIDIA can disrupt, come into market, and not just using hardware, but using software to play a major role. But as a whole, as innovation uh, continues to take form at scale, we all benefit. It means more intelligent software defined vehicles. It puts phones in our hands that are more powerful. It gives power to you know, cities, governments, and enterprises that can build applications and tools that give us social networks and give us data-driven experiences. So I'm very bullish and optimistic on as a whole. I said this before, I say it again, I believe semiconductors will eat the world. And then you know, you look at the, we didn't even really talk about the companies, um, you know, whether it's an AI uh, like you know, Grok or GraphCore. There are some very cool companies mm -hmm. building things. You've got Qualcomm bought Nuvia, another company that could, you know, come out of the blue and offer us new innovations in mobile and personal computing. I mean, there's so many cool companies, Dave, with the scale of data, the, uh, the, the growth and demand and desire for connectivity in the world. Um, it's never been a more interesting time to be a fan of technology. The only thing I will say as a whole, as a society, is I hope we can fix this problem because it, it does create risks, the supply chain, inflation, the economics, all that stuff ties together and a lot of people don't see that. But if we can't get this manufacturing issue under control, um, we didn't really talk about China, Dave, and I'll just say Taiwan and China are very physically close together and the way that China sees Taiwan and the way we see Taiwan is completely different. We have very little control over what can happen. We've all seen what's happened with Hong Kong. So there's just so many, as I said, when I started this conversation, we've got all these trains on the track. They're all moving, but they're not in parallel. These tracks are all converging, but the convergence isn't perpendicular. So sometimes we don't see how all these things interrelate, but as a whole, it's a very exciting time. Love being in technology and uh, love having the chance to come on here and talk with you. I love the optimism and you're right. Uh, uh, that competition in China, that's going to come from China as well. Xi has made it a part of his legacy, I think, to you know reincorporate Taiwan. That's going to be interesting to see. I mean, the, Taiwan ebb, ebbs and flows with regard to you know its leadership. Sometimes they're more pro, I guess I should say, less anti-China. <laughs> Maybe that's the better way to say it. Uh, and 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 you know, China's putting in big fab capacity for NAND. And, you know, maybe maybe people look at that. You know, some of that is the low end of the market. But you know, Clay Christensen would say, "Well, to go take a look at the steel industry and see what happened there." So, so we didn't talk much about China, and, and that was my oversight. But, but they're after self-sufficiency. It's not like they haven't tried before. Kind of like Intel has tried Foundry before, but I think they're really going for it this time. But, but now, what are your? Do you, do you believe that China will be able to get self-sufficiency? Let's say within the next. 10 to 15 years. 
With semiconductors? Yes. I would never count China out of anything if they put their mind to it, if it's something that they want to put absolute focus on. I think um, right now China vacillates between wanting to be a good player and a good steward to the world and wanting to completely run its own show. Uh, the the politicization of what's going on over there, we all saw what happened in the real estate market this past week. We saw what happened with tech ed over the last few months. We've seen what's happened with uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. It is not entirely clear if China wants to give the more capitalistic and innovation ecosystem a full try, but it is certainly shown that it wants to be seen as a world leader over the last few decades. It's accomplished that in almost any area that it wants to compete. Dave, I would say if this is one of Xi Jinping's primary focuses, wanting to do this, it would be very irresponsible to rule it out as a possibility. Mm. Daniel, I got to tell you, I, I, I love collaborating with you. Um, we met face to face just recently, and I hope we can do this again. I, I'd love to have you, you back on, on the program. Thanks so much for your, your time and insights today. Thanks for having me, Dave. So uh, Daniel's website, F Futurum Research, that's three U's in Futurum. Uh, check that out, futurumresearch.com. Uh, the, 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 this individual is really plugged in. He's forward thinking and, and, and a great resource. At Daniel Newman UV is his Twitter, so go follow him for some great stuff. And remember, these episodes, they're all available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search for Breaking Analysis Podcast. We publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. And by the way, Daniel, thank you for contributing your, your quotes to, to SiliconANGLE. The writers there love you. Uh, you can always connect on Twitter. I'm at dvellante. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com. Appreciate the comments on LinkedIn. And don't forget to check out etr.plus for all the survey data. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Be well, and we'll see you next time.